I'm happy to be here, <clears throat> be here on this occasion. I'm Pastor Sidney Hatch from Oregon. Uh, this occasion provides an opportunity to talk about something very precious to me and I'm sure very precious to my colleague Anthony here, and that's uh, the question or the doctrine of life only in Christ and uh, what happens when we die. And this matter of immortality, we, we all would like to live forever. And I feel the Bible has the answer. It's a very precious truth to me. And this moment, this program, gives me an opportunity to tell about it and to tell so about some Bible verses that, to me, have helped shed light on this question. Because I'd like to live forever. How is that possible? Can it come through faith in Christ? And I'm happy to be here and talk about it, Anthony. I'm delighted, too, to have this opportunity to speak about some of these fundamental <clears throat> questions of the Christian life. The issue that affects all of us, the matter of death. My name is Anthony Buzzard, and I'm an instructor at Atlanta Bible College. And uh, we're going to converse for a few moments about the question that affects all of us, whether we like it or not. What happens when we die? Is there an afterlife? What is the nature of that afterlife? And something about the nature of man. I see. So yeah. I believe you've written a book on this subject, Sid. Yes, Anthony, I have written a book here, a small book, and the title is Daring to Differ. It has a rather uh, long subtitle. I won't go into that at the present time. In this book, I tell my own personal experiences in learning the doctrines that helped me to see that there is life and immortality through faith in Christ. Uh, I deal with the doctrines, but this isn't a theological book. I want to assure our viewers of that. But it's a combination of truth with personal experience. And in this book, I deal with several key verses that changed my outlook on how, uh, on how everlasting life is possible and what does happen when, uh, when we die. I might pose this thought right now. We hear so much, so often, the question, I even encountered it in an airport uh, recently in flying uh, across the country. Where will you spend eternity? But I've come to feel uh, the question is, how will you spend eternity? And I wanted to mention that before I mention some of the verses that helped me to understand this. I think probably both of us have had the experience of, uh, of growing up and, and gaining the impression that when you die, a part of you goes to heaven this is what I learned uh -huh. in my church background, uh, almost as though one is a two-part being. There's a part yeah. of you that somehow doesn't die, though your body goes in the grave. Uh, there's a soul, an immaterial element in you mm -hmm. that survives consciously and goes to be somewhere else, probably in heaven, in some distant realm. Yeah. And uh, in my experience of reading the Bible, when I was introduced to the Bible uh, in, in my 20s, I began to question some of those fundamental things. Now, I think you've had that same sort of evolution in your thinking. Yes. In the beginning of my ministry, I believed that when I died, my soul, something immaterial in me, would go immediately to heaven. And I felt that people who did not accept Christ as Savior would go somewhere else. A very unpleasant thought, but you all know what I'm talking about. But there was one verse that changed my whole outlook. Mm -hmm. uh, Genesis 2, 7, we read there, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul or a living being. And when I saw in that verse, it says, we're living souls, not immortal souls, then I realized that uh, this coincided, this complemented the New Testament truth that when we die, we simply fall asleep. I like the words of the New Testament. We fall asleep in Jesus, and we sleep until the return of Christ, and then the resurrection takes place. And you know, here's a little catchphrase I like to use. I'm not an immortal soul now. I'm just a living soul. But Anthony, when Jesus comes back again, and I wake up from the sleep of death, then I will become an immortal soul. And yes. that's the transformation that took place in my thinking. So it's something you're going to have to wait for. It's not as though you have immortality now, but you're hoping to gain that immortality in resurrection. That's the difference then. Yes. And that reminds me of a very precious verse in the New Testament. 
1 Corinthians 15, that wonderful chapter is not about the immortality of the soul. The very phrase is not in the New Testament. That chapter is about the resurrection of the dead. And what you just said reminds me of how Paul closes that chapter. He says, thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that victory is a victory over death and the grave. We're awakened and uh, he, he gives us then resurrection life or immortality mm -hmm. and then we shall live forever. It's a gift from God. Mm -hmm. We're not born with it. Mm -hmm. I didn't inherit it from my parents. I didn't even get it from our forefather Adam, mm -hmm. but I'm a mortal being. Um, to borrow the words of Abraham, I am but dust and ashes, but God can give me everlasting life. But I must be patient and wait till his son returns from heaven and then I will receive it as a gift. I didn't mean to preach such a long expository message, Anthony, but uh, I know there's something you'd like to share there too. Well, I think that what we both of us found in examining this question from the Bible, uh, taking the Bible as one standard, of course, as uh -huh. an inspired record from God, because only yeah. he knows what he can do. Uh, obviously, we cannot res resurrect ourselves. We're entirely dependent upon Christ and upon God for that process. But I think we've seen that it isn't that we have immortal souls, rather it is that we are souls. Yeah, right. And in Genesis we find the animals are souls in the same right. way that human uh -huh. beings are. It's simply that God breathed life into us and we became living souls. Right. So the term soul in the Bible is rather akin to the way we use the word person. Right. Uh, such that, for instance, ex ex the example might be that eight souls had perished in a disaster, eight persons. Yeah. Uh, survived the flood, for mm -hmm. example. And so I see a difference here between what I was taught, I think, originally, and this notion that there was a part of me that could live on and survive is not biblical. No. Now, that must come from some source. How do we account for the fact that that notion of going to heaven when you die as a soul yeah. is so widespread and so popular? Well, you just reminded me of something very important. Jesus taught the resurrection of the dead. But in the ancient Greek world and among men like Plato, the Greek philosopher, he believed that there is within us a, uh, a soul, as we think of it, a spirit being. And Plato taught, and the other Greek philosophers taught that when we die, this soul, uh, I don't like to use the phrase, but let me uh, say almost like a ghost, this soul leaves the body and it lives on. Now that came from the ancient Greek world and down through the early centuries of the Christian era. This idea came in to the church and it replaced the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And I'd like to make a statement here that may surprise some of our viewers, but the idea of the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of the dead really are two contradictory terms, mm -hmm. Anthony. If we have immortal souls, we don't need a resurrection. According to the Bible, we don't have immortal souls. So therefore, we need a resurrection from the dead. Are we going to follow Jesus or are we going to follow Plato? And you know, that's the question. <laughs> yeah. It seems as though the Greek influence there has been mixed with the biblical view because uh, although you say that the resurrection has been downplayed, it has not, of course, been taken out of the Christian scheme. No. We still talk about the resurrection of the body at the end. But since the soul in the popular scheme has already gone to heaven, it certainly diminishes the importance of the resurrection very much because if you've already made it, so to speak, as an immaterial soul in heaven yeah, at right. the point of death, uh -huh. then a future resurrection seems to be uh, rather unimportant compared with this other expression of, of the soul surviving. Well, that, that's true. If the soul survives and goes to heaven, then the resurrection becomes sort of a reincarnation of a soul in a body. But I maintain that's not really resurrection. As I said already, it's a re-embodiment mm -hmm. of this soul. Now, in the, in the scripture, the resurrection, we can take it from several aspects. It's awakening us from the sleep of death. If we have, if we have been dead for many centuries, we become the dust of the earth. We're actually recreated. And there are words that, uh, words that uh, bring out that idea. I won't try to mention them at this time. But our God is able to bring us back into existence, and that is involved in the resurrection. 
Uh, I wanted to say a word about John 3.16. Maybe you want, uh, you would like to share a thought there, Anthony, on John 3.16 is a key verse in this regard, too. Yes, that's a very popular verse. Everybody knows it, I think, even uh -huh. without looking it up in the Bible, that God so loved the world that he gave his unique son so that those who believe in him and his teachings, so to speak, believing in Jesus always implies believing in his teachings, should not perish, should not go to rack and ruin, yeah. but have the life of the coming age. Normally translated as eternal life in our Bibles, but many commentators point out that that's really a good Jewish rabbinical expression. Life in the coming age of the kingdom is what God is offering us. Right. And elsewhere then we find, as you were saying about the resurrection, that that life in the kingdom can only be gained through resurrection of the whole person. Right. So I think the difference that I saw, uh, and you've, you've seen the same thing in the Bible, is that man is a total unit in, in biblical thinking. Uh -huh, right. It isn't the nature of man to be bipartite with a soul no. that goes to heaven and a body that goes to the grave, but man as a totality dies <coughs> and goes into the grave, and so man as a totality must be raised from the dead. Yeah, right. That's actually very much simpler for teaching children and teaching ourselves I'll just mention one verse that uh, has affected me. Daniel, the, the 12th chapter, and mm -hmm. verse 2, we have a remarkable statement there where Daniel, looking forward into the future, a vision, really, of the resurrection, says that many of those who are sleeping in the dust of the ground will arise, will right. awaken yeah. to a, a everlasting life. Mm -hmm. Now, that tells us simply what the dead are doing. They're sleeping. It also tells us exactly where they're doing it. They're not yeah. doing it in heaven. No, they're no. doing it in the dust of the ground. Yeah. Now, that's remarkably simple, and I think uh, all uh, biblical scholars would recognize that that's a plain statement of the uh -huh. sleep of the dead doctrine, which has not been always popular uh, overall in Christianity, but has always had its advocates yeah. in Christian people. Uh, let me uh, uh, bring up another point here, too, and one reason I... Uh, brought up the matter of John 3.16. This raises another question, not a question, but it brings out another truth. If man is not an immortal soul, then there is no such thing as eternal torment right. for the lost. And this vindicate, <coughs> excuse me, this vindicates the character of God. Our God is a kind and just heavenly Father. He's not a cruel tyrant who's going to run a private torture chamber throughout all eternity. Uh, the issue becomes life or death. And those of us, those who through faith in Christ are raised in the resurrection will live in the kingdom. The question comes, what about the lost? What about the lost? Uh, if they are not immortal souls, that simply means, and God knows all the details, but that simply means that they will not have everlasting life. And the scripture term is destruction. Sometimes it's called annihilation. That's not really a biblical word. Uh, God destroys the wicked, and the details of that we leave to him. But God is not going to torment immortal souls in a place commonly called hell uh, forever and forever. And oh, what a, this, what a different light this sheds on the character and the holiness and the goodness, the righteous of, righteousness of God. Good. It's life or death not life in heaven or a life in a, in a place commonly called hell, okay. an eternal torture chamber. This meant so much to me when I saw this truth of life in Christ. May I say just a word here, Anthony? The title of my book, Daring to Differ, uh, I called it that because we differ from the popular idea of immortal souls in heaven or immortal souls burning in hell. We believe in the sleep of the dead, the resurrection, and then the wicked who defy God, re reject Christ, simply, uh, simply destroyed. And we do differ in that respect from many, many of our friends and, <clears throat> and those who also uh, claim the name of Christ. But that is our distinctive anyway.